in the name of the triune God, who calls each living creature beloved. Please be seated. I was saying earlier to somebody, I still kind of can't get over the fact that this is the first time in three years we've been able to do Easter together. And I'm so happy to see you all. So let's do this again. Alleluia! Christ is risen! The Lord is risen Alleluia! And I actually do want to acknowledge each one of you, each individual person who is here. You are priceless. You are a gift of God. I also want to acknowledge everybody who's joining us over the live stream. You two are with us. You are priceless and a gift from God. Finally, I also want to acknowledge the loved ones who were here the last time we were able to gather to celebrate Easter together, but who now exist within the vastness of God's holy mystery, united with the presence and love of God, who are also each priceless, a gift of God. Don Hawkinson, Body of Marie, Russ Bretner, Christina Huck, Linda Anderson, Bob Harvey, Rex Gaskill, and so many others who we love but see no longer. Yet, they are here with us in our hearts, in our love and memories, and in the shattering insistence of Easter that death does not have the last word. And even though Easter is all about joy, it doesn't start there. It starts with Mary weeping in the garden. You know, her grief for her beloved is absolute. There is nothing else. She couldn't do anything about his suffering or his death. But the one thing she could do was to care for his body. And even that was taken away from her. So when she sees this person standing in front of her in the garden, this gardener, she didn't care who he was. She just wanted to get the body back. And when Jesus said her name, and she recognizes him, I can only imagine her shock and her joy, and maybe also kind of this terrible hesitation to hope that he really is alive, in case it was a dream. And I imagine her throwing her arms around him and just sobbing. And I imagine her arms would not peel themselves off him. They refused. Because there was no way he could be there. And yet he was. Yet he was there in a way she could not possess. She could not own him or cage him or keep him. He was there in the overwhelming power of a love that knew no bounds, that was so deep and so broad, it was bigger than every other human experience. I mean, can you own the Grand Canyon? Can you hold the ocean? In the holy mystery we call God, the meaning of Jesus, the meaning of resurrection and Easter, is that the deepest reality, kind of the DNA of reality, is a fusion of love and life that is indestructible, that expresses itself in this physical world and in the connection, the Ubuntu, between all things, between all of us. So Easter cannot be understood. It can only be experienced. And it was meant to be experienced not only by Mary in the garden. That is what we at church are all about. That is the whole purpose of us being here at all. And yet, this deepest reality, this fusion of love and life, the presence we call the risen Christ, is only recognizable a tiny bit at a time. Mary Magdalene didn't recognize Jesus until he called her by name. Peter and John were so focused on the details that they could understand, which were, you know, the grave clothes lying there, the stone rolled away, the missing body, 
that they apparently just ran right past Jesus, you know, in the garden. And the angels in the tomb, too. Later the same evening, Jesus appears to his disciples who are in a locked room. They are grieving and traumatized. And when they see him, they're just terrified. And they don't believe it's him until he shows them his wounds. The disciples on the road to Emmaus felt their hearts burning, but they didn't recognize Jesus until he did that thing he always did, to break the bread in front of them. It seems that resurrection and hope and life happen less like waving a magic wand and more like the slow onset of spring. In fact, if you think about it, the meaning of Easter comes to us just like this spring comes to us, which is way too slowly. <laughs> I hope you'll let me digress just a little bit. I have not been much of a gardener in my life, but the pandemic changed all that. We spent so much time at home that we got to know so many things about our backyard that we previously didn't know. For example, the squirrels, which Carly named Buffy, Sniper, Eric the Red, and Midnight. We tried to create some native perennial gardens, but they just ended up being kind of a riot of tangled prairie plants that we called the bug jungles. <laughs> and this spring, I wanted to try him. So, I don't know if you know her, St. John's member, Courtney Hammond, I'm not sure she's here, but she is an excellent gardener and she also works very close to my house. So last week, I asked her if she would swing by and, you know, talk to me about gardening. And so we walked through the yard, and what amazed me is that Courtney could identify the bushes in our yard, even though they had no leaves on them, no flowers, no leaves, nothing. I mean, to me, they looked like a bunch of twigs. But to her, they were spirea, and burning bush, and hydrangea. Courtney has spent time paying attention to these living beings who are our plant neighbors. And she loves them. So she notices them and she recognizes them. And even when we went to the bug jungles, which just had a lot of winter interest in them, which means, you know, all the dead stems and leaves that I didn't clean up from last year, yet Courtney pointed out something that I hadn't noticed at all. Underneath all of those dead leaves and things were a whole bunch of thyme plants growing and thriving. I mean, time, as in like the spice, time that you put in soups. You know, I only know how to recognize time by its smell and by how it looks in those little plastic containers you get at the grocery store. But Courtney knew time as a living plant, as a living thing. She picked a stem and she let me smell it. And sure enough, it is time. I even put some in my soup. I was delighted. The angels and Jesus in today's story asked the disciples and Mary who they were looking for. If you notice, they didn't ask them, what are you looking for? But who? Courtney recognized these plants in my backyard because I think she knows them as living beings and loves them. I think we are not looking for something, but someone. And when we realize it, that, our perception changes. What we notice changes. As Heidi said in her sermon last night, we can rest because it turns out we don't find Jesus. He finds us. He's been there all along. The risen Christ exists in each one of us and in the fabric of love, the weave of reality that knits us together. Where is Jesus? He's sitting right next to you. 
In our baptismal covenants, we say, don't we, that we seek and serve Christ in all persons. He is within you, looking out your eyes at your neighbors and loved ones. And you know, if Christ is the presence of God made manifest in physical reality, then in some sense, he's even growing in your garden. We can meet him here at his table within ourselves, in one another, and in fact, anywhere and everywhere we go. So let spring come to your soul and your heart. Wake up. So much is possible that we never even dreamed. And the risen Christ is hard to recognize. Things in this world and even church are changing and they're different. There is no way to get back to the place that we were before. You know, Jesus was not resuscitated. He rose from the dead in a new form that could not be contained. And in that new form, in the assurance that God is with us, the risen Christ finds us. Each of us, our lives, and relationships, our church and our world is being made new in the midst of our losses. Out of the dead of winter, spring always comes. Christ is present. Christ is risen. Alleluia. Amen. <laughs>